Hello, everyone. Welcome to join us on the IWA webinar of New Insights and Innovations for Advanced Water Treatment. I am Yu Meng Zhao from Harbin Institute of Technology in China, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Um, so before the start of the webinar, there are a few notes that I would like to remind you. Um, this webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA website with presentation slides and other information. And uh, the speakers are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present of which they're not the legal copyright holder. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. And uh, also during the presentation, if you have questions for our panelists, Please use the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand side of the Zoom meeting to send questions to the panelists. You can select these questions and answer them during the Q&A session. Um, and then I will uh, briefly introduce the IWA specialist group, design, uh, design operation and maintenance of drinking water treatment plants. This specialist group aims to enhance networking and exchange of practices uh, and experience on operational issues for those involved in the design and operation of drinking water treatment plants and contribute to better understand the operational needs and help solving operational problems. Um, this specialist group aims to promote the discussion and communication of the core issues related to the drinking water treatment plants including health risk related to emerging parameters, uh, NOM removal, advanced treatment processes for new micropollutants removal, application and case studies solving operational issues, and smart tools for analyzing plant data. The specialist group is organized by Professor Jun Ma from Harbin Institute of Technology and Dr. Yik Cha Ho from University Technology Patronus in Malaysia. The committee members include Professor Tian Hongshu from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, Dr. Ines Breda from Silhorko Eurowater in Denmark, Dr. Stravka Do Kwan from Swiss Environment in France, Mr. Jacob Mangor from Ghana Water Company in Ghana, and Mr. Rio Centro from Water Safety Plan in Portugal. And uh, back to today's webinar, we are very honored to invite three well-known scholars to talk about new insights and innovations for advanced water treatment. They are Professor Ersman Gruntun from IWAC or EPFL in Switzerland, Professor Xin Xie from Georgia Institute of Technology in US, and uh, Dr. Ria Verbecki from KU Leuven in Belgium. The talk by each speaker should be controlled in 20 minutes. And afterwards, we will have another 20 minutes for the Q&A session. So without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Professor Ersman Gruntun. He will be talking about the application of chemical oxidants for enhanced water treatment. Uh, so welcome, Professor Van Gwinton. The floor is all yours now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk here. It's a pleasure and also for the kind introduction. And as mentioned, I will talk about chemical oxidation processes for enhanced water treatment. So, so if you look at the application of chemical oxidants for micropollutant abatement, and this is now the main topic. This was uh, initially really a success story, and it was mainly applied for drinking water, originally for removal of inorganic compounds such as sulfide, nitrite, iron and manganese, and also taste and other compounds and color. And then gradually the field moved into organic contaminants, and uh, there was the focus on biologically active compounds. Uh, they are abated, they can be abated, but the question is what happens to them? They're typically not mineralized, so we have to know something about these transformation products. And then also currently more and more applications are done in wastewater for enhanced wastewater treatment and uh, water reuse. And there, of course, the matrix becomes a much more important factor as well. So if you look for a perfect oxidant, uh, this uh, search has been going on for quite a long time. We basically have to look at the feasibility. So this is the availability of oxidants. So for example, 
chlorine is quite uh, readily available, so it's quite a feasible oxidant. But then we also have to look at the side effects. So, for example, disinfection byproduct formation, and then the broad applicability to micropollutant oxidation. So we should have a, an oxidant that is maybe not so selective. So, for example, chlorine is very feasible. So this should be much higher, this bar here. But then we form a lot of disinfection byproducts, and it's also not broadly applicable for micropollutant oxidation. So this means chlorine is probably not a very good choice. Uh, permanganate, for example, would be very feasible. Also, little disinfection byproduct formation, but not such a broad ap applicability for micropollutant oxidation. So basically, we have to move back in this figure to this corner here. And there we see that we have mostly UV and ozone-based processes that have this potential for a broad applicability for micropollutant oxidation, limited disinfection byproduct formation, and they're also quite feasible. So I will mostly concentrate on this on these kinds of uh, oxidants, so including ozone, but also uh, hydroxyl radical oxidation. So now if you look at uh, an oxidation, an oxidant, and uh, the primary goal is to disinfect the water, so we would target microorganisms, but also micropollutants, and this is now the focus of this talk. And then we transform these micropollutants into transformation products. But at the same time, these oxidants also react with the matrix, so with bromide and iodide, but also phenolic uh, substances in the dissolved organic matter. And this leads to the undesired side effects, disinfection byproducts. We have the formation of haloorganic compounds, so such as chlorinated and brominated compounds. But we also form oxygen-rich compounds, such as aldehydes and ketones. And then we can also form halogenates, uh, such as, for example, the bromate. So this is basically the scheme that we have to consider if we apply advanced oxidation processes to water treatment. So now I would like to zoom in to the micropollutants and the efficiency of micropollutant abatement is given by the kinetics. And these are typically determined by laboratory experiments. And, but also nowadays we can use quantum chemical calculations. And then these uh, micropollutants are transformed into transformation products. So we need to know something about mechanisms. Uh, and uh, there we also have to use advanced uh, analytical tool, tools, mostly uh, some separation techniques coupled with uh, MS. Uh, we can also use prediction tools. I will show you that in a minute. And then we also have to assess uh, the toxicity of these transformation products relative to the target compounds. So here, this is mostly done by bioassays, but also there are some in silico, in silico toxicity evaluations that are available. And then also another factor is the biodegradability of these transformation products. So we can do this with culture experiments, but also biofiltration experiments in pilot or full scale, or then use biodegradability models. So now I will focus on some of these aspects in my presentation. So here I have an example of uh, this uh, a platform that we developed. This is to predict the kinetics and transformation products for uh, during ozonation. Here I show you the example of carbamazepine and uh, we have uh, an in silico tool. So this is a computer-based tool that we have developed and we can determine the reactivity. So we can determine uh, second order rate constants. Basically we look at these molecules in terms of the reactive sites. And uh, then we can use quantum chemical calculations and also quantum uh, quantitative structure activity relationships to determine the second order rate constants for reactions uh, with ozone. Uh, on this side, we basically look at the transformation products that can be formed. So there is also a predictor for this, and this includes uh, about 100 
reaction rules that are applied to certain functional groups. And then we can predict what kind of compounds are formed. And uh, the blue ones here, they are compounds that can actually be found in uh, during ozonation process. So this can help us for a targeted analysis of such compounds. We can determine what kind of masses these compounds are, and then we can also find them in these in under realistic conditions. The other thing that I mentioned is the kinetics. So this here is an experimental approach to measure kinetics. And here we looked at the oxidation of sulfamethoxazole by ozone and OH radicals. Here you see the second order rate constant as a function of the pH for this molecule. This molecule has two pKa values. One is for this aniline group, that's the lower one. And the higher one is for this uh, nitrogen here. And we see that there is a pH dependence, but in the uh, pH range that is relevant for water treatment, we have more or less a stable second order rate constant, almost 10 to the six per molar per second. And if you calculate the half lifetime of this compound for a concentration of ozone of one milligram per liter, we have less than 0.1 seconds. So this compound is very quickly oxidized. And we wanted to know what happens with its uh, antimicrobial activity because sulfamethoxazole is an antibiotic. And therefore, we plotted the residual potency. So this is the antimicrobial activity as a function of the relative residual concentration. So if this uh, compound is uh, by the first attack loses its biological activity, we should follow this one-to-one -one line here. And we did this for ozone. So you see here, this is really nicely on this one-to-one -one line. So this means the degradation or the disappearance of this compound is directly connected to the loss of its antimicrobial activity. And we also did this for OH radicals and this also lies on this line. So this means that basically the attack of the, or the, slight transformation of this molecule leads to a complete loss of its antimicrobial activity. And we have done this for other types of compounds, for pesticides, but also for uh, um, estrogenic compounds, etc. And we have found quite the similar behavior. So this is actually good news. We don't have to degrade these compounds completely, but we can already uh, find the uh, degradation of their uh, uh, biological activity by the degrad uh, partial degradation of these molecules. So this is kind of the normal case. There are also cases where this doesn't happen. And I just want to show you a very nice and classical example. This is a fungicide that was applied a lot in the European Union. And this fungicide, tolulfluoride, is transformed biologically in the soil. Uh, about 20% of this is transformed to this DMS. So this is dimethyl sulfamide. And uh, what happens with this dimethyl sulfamide is that when it's ozonated, uh, it's transformed with very high yield of 50% to nitrosodimethylamine. Uh, NDMA, which is a mutagenic and carcinogenic compound. This was discovered by uh, some researchers at the TZW in Karlsruhe. And uh, basically, they found it during ozonation of drinking water. The DMS levels, so the levels of this compound, they were in the low microgram per liter range. And this led to several hundred nanograms per liter of NDMA in the drinking water. So this is above what is recommended by the World Health Organization. They had to shut down the ozonation. And this led to a very fast ban of tolulfluoride in most European countries. So we were approached by these two researchers uh, to find out what's actually going on. And uh, we were quite naive. We just added some ozone to a solution that contains this DMS, but we didn't find any NDMA. So there must be something in the matrix. So this was done in, in ultra purified water. There, there must be something in the matrix that leads to 
the formation of NDMA, and we found that actually bromide catalyzes this reaction. So uh, if you look at the NDMA formation for low concentrations, there's almost none. But then if you increase the bromide concentration just a little bit, it shoots up. If bromide would be involved in a one-to-one -one reaction here, then uh, we should be on this line. So there is a, a dramatic enhancement of NDMA formation in, uh, in presence of bromide, and this points towards uh, bromide catalysis. And uh, we also have a very high yield of uh, uh, larger than 50%. So this is an enormous yield for a precursor for NDMA formation. So finally, we figured out what the mechanism of this uh, reaction is. So if you have bromide in the water, this can be oxidized by ozone to hyperbromous acid. And then the hyperbromous acid can react with this DMS. So this uh, hyperbromous acid reacts much more quickly with DMS than ozone. We form the brominated DMS, and then this brominated DMS can react with ozone to form uh, more than 50% NDMA, and the rest is uh, nitrate. So this was quite uh, an interesting discovery, and uh, it's actually an unpredictable cocktail. We have a fungicide that is applied, we have some bacteria that transform it, then we have bromide and we add ozone for water treatment. We mix this and we form a toxic compound. So there are uh, not so many examples like that, but uh, I think we always have to be careful that uh, unintended reactions can occur. So now I would like to go to the next topic. This is the biodegradability of transformation products. And uh, we did a study in a, a pilot plant that consisted of an ozonation and the sand filtration of lake water. We spiked uh, 51 compounds. We found 187 transformation products. And uh, we looked at the structures that can be abated. They contained mostly oxygen, so such as aldehydes, carbonyl compounds, carboxylic compounds, alcohols, and amides. And uh, they're mostly formed from aromatic and uh, olefinic uh, compounds. But what we saw is that only 24 of this 187, so this is 13% of the transformation products were better biodegradable than the parent compounds. So this is shown here. So here we see basically in blue compounds that are similarly abated as the uh, target compound, then in orange worse and better. And we see mainly that uh, for aromatic and olefinic target compounds, we have a better degradability. And these are also the compounds that lead mostly to aldehydes and carbonyl compounds that can be degraded. So the, the, um, what we can learn from this is that basically, you know, the uh, assumption that we only have to partially oxidize a micropollutant and then we can easily degrade it biologically is not always true. And I think there's certainly more research needed to further investigate this correlation between uh, target compound structure and the abatement of the transformation products. So now to end this talk, I would like to go into the reactions with the dissolved organic matter. And dissolved organic matter, as I showed before, is the main consumer of oxidants. And this leads uh, to the well-known disinfection byproducts. And the most reactive sites are phenolic moieties. We have about uh, one to two millimoles of phenol per gram of DOC. So if you have uh, five milligrams per liter of DOC, this means there's about 10 micromolar of phenols. If you look at the sum of micropollutant concentrations in a wastewater effluent, in a study in Switzerland, we found that the concentration of micropollutants is about 0.2 micromolar. So this is a uh, uh, significantly a factor of 50 lower than the concentration of the phenolic moiety. So this means that the ozone will only be available 2% to react with micropollutants and of the OH radicals, we have even a smaller percentage. So we have to look at these products from the reaction of DOM with ozone and OH radicals. Uh, and the phenolic moieties are, of course, also important precursors for disinfection byproducts. 
So we did, did a study in a full-scale ozonation of wastewater effluent. We derivatized the samples with uh, TSH, and uh, this is specific for carbonyl compounds. We found 46 carbonyl formulas, uh, and we looked at the formation of these carbonyl formulas as a function of the ozone dose. We applied the uh, 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and one milligram of ozone per milligram of carbon. Uh, we saw that this is correlated to a measuring parameter, the electron donating capacity that uh, is a, a parameter that uh, is a summary for aromatic compounds. And uh, we also found that uh, there is a, a biodegradation during sand filtration. So here you see the increase of the, of the uh, relative areas of these compounds as a function of the ozone dose. And then we see that uh, this uh, there is a significant decrease of these areas again in the sand filtration. So this means that these, uh, uh, <clears throat> these products that are formed from the matrix, they are quite easily biodegradable in uh, biological sand filtration after ozonation. So that's why it's also very important to have a biotreatment after ozonation. So with that, I would like to come to the outlook. And uh, I think we have to develop more predictive reaction tools for kinet kinetics and product formation. There are too many compounds that we can measure uh, one after the other. Then we should combine experimental studies with quantum chemical computations. This has shown uh, we have shown that this is quite fruitful to uh, investigate mechanisms. Also, the prediction tools, they can be coupled with in silico toxicity evaluation and biodegradation tools. So we don't have to do all the measurements. Then we also need to have a better understanding of DOM. And we have started to work on tailored chemical approaches. So we do selective titrations, derivatizations, and tagging. And then we also need improved tools for the in interpretation of non-target MS data, because uh, these workflows are not efficient enough and very time consuming if one wants to look at transformation products. Finally, uh, in recent studies and also in our laboratory, we have started to use stable isotopes to elucidate reaction mechanisms. And I think this is also a very nice new tool that can be applied. So with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I would like to acknowledge uh, quite a lot of people who were involved in the studies that I've shown, then also some funding from various funding. Um, I think uh, there uh, might be some uh, connection problem uh, from Professor Van Quinten. Um, so uh, moving on to our next speaker uh, is Professor Xin Xie from Georgia Institute of Technology in US. Uh, he will be talking about the locally enhanced electric field treatment or LEAPT for drinking water disinfection. Uh, so Professor Xie, the floor is all yours now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Yimen, for a nice introduction, and I also thank IWA for the invitation. So it's really my great pleasure to be here and sharing a new technology we have been working on in the past few years, and then the technology is called locally enhanced electric field treatment. Uh, we are currently mainly used for drinking water treatment, drinking water disinfection. So I think most of the audience here are familiar with uh, water disinfection. So let me just directly explain uh, what is the electric field treatment. Uh, okay, so yeah, so here is a schematic showing with the electric field treatment. So basically, um, we have a uh, two electrodes here. So one is positive and one is negative, right? So and then there will be a uh, uh, if it's a parallel electrode, there will be a uniform electric field distributed in between. And then if we have microorganisms indicated by these uh, shapes, and then uh, basically there will be a strong uh, electric field, uh, you know, basically they'll be exposed to this electric field. So what happens in this condition is that uh, there'll be uh, charged ions in the solution, and then the positive ions will move towards the negative electrode, and then the negative, like, negative charged ions will, to, will move towards the positive electrode, right? And then so the movement of these ions will basically uh, uh, 
generate uh, we, we so uh, it's called transmembrane uh, potential across the membrane so uh, and at least transmembrane potential will increase uh, along with the uh, external electric field so if the electric field strength external electric field strength is high enough basically we'll be able to uh, generate pores in the cell uh, in a cell, on the cell membrane so uh, this is different to electrochemical reaction which will you know trigger electrochemical oxidation or reduction in this case, it's pretty much uh, we call we consider it's a physical process. Is or you can consider it's a, a ionic scissor which we really cut the membrane uh, open and then generate the pores. So in this case, um, it really depends on the the strength of, uh, of the external electric field. So in some cases, these pores can be recovered. We call it reversible electroporation. And then if the if the uh, electric field strength is high enough or uh, last for in a long enough time. And these elect electroporated pores will be can be permanent, and in this case, these microorganisms can be inactivated. So, uh, in the biomedical field, people have tried to use this process to do uh, you know, drug delivery, gene delivery. In most cases, they still want to keep the microorganism uh, alive after these uh, processes. In the some special cases, they also want to uh, inactivate some cells. Um, but basically, we have we have been thinking about whether we can use this for large scale uh, water disinfection, water treatment. The challenge is really that uh, to generate a very you know the electric field that's strong enough to keep, to inactivate most microorganisms, uh, the electric field strength need to be very high. So with a certain distance, so the electric field strength is determined by the applied voltage divided by the distance uh, of the two electrodes. So in this case, usually we cannot have a uh, the distance of the electrodes to, between the electrodes to be very, very narrow. So in most cases, we have to apply several kilovolts of the voltage to realize a strong electric field that's, you know, good enough to kill my converse. So this is fine for very small scale applications, but it's definitely not applicable for large scale water treatment, water disinfection. So basically, this is the, 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 uh, the idea we come up with. We want to use that to do water disinfection, but there's also an obvious challenge there. So in the past few years, we have tried to work on two directions, trying to basically uh, uh, minimize or reduce the voltage you need to apply. And then that can we, then in that case, we can apply this technology for uh, at least a larger scale water disinfection. So basically, we call this technology locally enhanced electric field treatment. The general concept is that rather than generating a, a uniform electric field strength between two parallel electrodes, we want to uh, enhance the electric field at a local position or the location in the reactor. And then the next step is basically trying to use the mixing or other mechanisms and then push the microorganisms to these regions so they can be you know, exposed to the strong electric field and then be inactivated. Okay, so to realize this locally enhanced electric field, we have tried uh, two strategies, which one is in the macro scale and the other is in, in, uh, at the micro scale. And on um, the macro scale, basically, we, we design different configuration of the of the chambers or the reactors. One example is that we can have this coaxial design of the, uh, of the system. For example, we have a positive electrode at the center, and then we have a negative electrode uh, at the outer, outer ring. So in this case, actually, we will be able to generate a much stronger electric field near the center electrode. Uh, it really depends on the, 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 the ratio and the size of these uh, coaxial electrodes. This can be uh, at least 20, 30 times enhanced uh, um, base uh, uh, of the background electric field strengths. Another scale is a micro scale. Basically, what we're doing is that we modify the electrical surface with these kind of tip structures. And then uh, it really depends, again, the aspect ratio of these tip structures. It can be nanowires, microwires. Micro but basically, if this is a sharp tip, what we can do is that we can significantly enhance the electric field strength near the tip of these uh, structures. It's also called a, a, a lightning rod effect. Basically, you will have a highly concentrated uh, uh, charge density at the tip. And then uh, around this area, the electric field strength will be much higher. Uh, you know, uh, this enhancement can be easily increased to several orders of magnitude, two to three orders of magnitude, really depends on the design and then, uh, the size. By doing that, what we really want to reach, achieve is that with a much smaller voltage, a few volts or uh, uh, at least uh, less than 100 volts, we'll be able to realize strong electric field that's high enough to kill microorganisms. Okay, to, to demonstrate this idea, we have uh, Develop this coaxial electrolyte device, 
which combines this macro, macro scale and micro scale enhancement effect. So this is a schematic. Basically, we have a center electro, we have outer electro, and then for the center electro, we modify the surface with these kind of a, a nano wire structures. Uh, we usually will set the center electro as a positive electro because uh, the, most of the microorganisms they have a negative surface charge. So by doing that, basically, we, we will be able to uh, uh, basically drive the microorganisms towards towards the center part, which 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 will have the uh, enhanced electric field treatment. So here is the kind of simulation indicating that how these electric field strengths can be really enhanced to force by you know, several mag uh, mag several orders of magnitude when it's close to the center electro and especially close to the tips of these standard wires. And I just show you a, a kind of a first prototype developed in our lab a couple of years ago, and then uh, showing the very small scale applications still at this point. Um, and then we, we test this system uh, with you know, different voltage, different flow rate. Basically, the idea is that we, we, we have successfully demonstrated that with a very small voltage, just one volt or two volt. And then we can, with a reasonable flow rate, we can uh, already achieve more than six log removal of a, a model bacterial E. coli. We also test the system with uh, different strains uh, of bacteria, gram, gram positive, gram negative. We also dose the uh, river water, uh, natural water system with uh, model bacteria, also re uh, achieved similar results. We also have tried to scale up this process a little bit. This is the kind of second uh, generation of the prototype in our lab. We, we basically increase the, the length from about just 10, 10 12 centimeter to uh, close to two meter. And then uh, basically we can successfully increase the flow rate. Basically we try to maintain the retention time and then uh, increase the flow rate. Uh, using this larger device. Um, we basically, the, we have been thinking about the real application of this, this kind of system specifically for this coaxial uh, electrical design. Um, still, it's still far away from the practical application, still in you know, very early stage uh, for bench scale demonstration, but we believe maybe this can this technology can be used in the pipeline systems for water, uh, for water disinfection, for a secondary water disinfection in the distribution systems. Uh, we also demonstrate that, uh, also do some theoretical calculation that uh, the energy required for these lift devices is actually very, very low. And potentially this can be, you know, uh, directly recovered from the flowing water. You, we can just incorporate uh, a, a very straightforward uh, water turbine uh, uh, generator layer to recover a little bit of energy from the flowing water. That's already good enough to, to power the, uh, the, the lift device. So uh, basically in the past couple of years, we have been working on this technology uh, on different aspects of the uh, of this technology. For example, we have been developing electrodes. As you can see, the electro is really the, the kind of a, a core component of the, the lift device. So at the beginning, it only lasts for about 10 minutes, 20, 20 minutes so after a couple of years of development. Currently, uh, the state of our electrodes can last for at least a couple of days. And then, but it's still tested in the uh, pretty much controlled uh, you know, lab environment, still not, good, not ready for, for real practical water application. Uh, we also try to develop different power sources, uh, you, uh, as you can see before, which is using the flowing water. We also try to use a, a hand pump, uh, a hand powered pump to power the system. We, the system, because the voltage is very low, can be also easily powered by a cell phone. Um, we have demonstrated the, the, the lift device itself can be can achieve pretty high uh, microbial activation efficiency, uh, but still in kind of with a pretty low throughput, pretty low flow rate. So we have also developed a lift technology combined with conventional disinfection uh, disinfectants. For example, we have combined lift with copper. We also combine lift with uh, uh, ozone. Basically, the idea is that we can use much lower concentration, either copper or ozone. Uh, combined with lift to, to realize a very uh, a high performance in terms of microbial inactivation. Um, so this is a really kind of very uh, brief introduction of this technology we call it lift. Uh, one, one, uh, basically the second thing, the later part of today's uh, presentation, I really want to highlight one uh, kind of a some of our recent progress in terms of trying to figure out what's the really mechanism of this lift process. So basically, uh, as I mentioned, we have demonstrated uh, this lift device can achieve very high performance. But uh, and we also know that uh, the microbial uh, the, 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 the micro scale enhancement 
in these systems, the basically these nano wires play a very important role to further enhance the, the, uh, the electric field strength. But overall, this is the, just a device looks like a you know really, really looks like a black box. We still really don't quite we're still not quite sure you know uh, what is what is uh, exactly happening when water is being traded by this device. Uh, we believe there's there's electroporation just as I mentioned at the early beginning, but we are not sure whether there are some other mechanisms we, which also play a very important you know, in this process. So basically, this is like a black box for us. We know water goes in and goes out, microorganisms being activated with very high efficiency. But the, the key point in, in, for this, uh, our current recent re research is that we want to open this black box. We want to really, uh, really study. And then we want to look at this process in situ with these so-called lab on the chip devices to really study what's really going on during this lift process. So a little bit detail about the methods. So basically we developed this kind of lab on the chip devices on a piece of glass light. So this is a piece of glass light with uh, gold coating on the surface. So this goldish color is a, a is the pattern with gold coating and then between this is this is a very narrow uh, kind of a, a gap between these two pads we have patterned this kind of micro scale nano needles or nano wedges uh, which we're trying to use that to demonstrate the, the locally enhanced electric treatment so basically the next step once we have this step on the chip device we uh, basically use some staining method and then we also basically mobilize uh, the model bacteria styrococcus on the surface and then it will look like this uh, after this uh, uh, loading of the microorganisms. And then we just put it under the microscope and then we apply like electric, uh, electric field treatment. And then we do this institute characterization uh, during this process. So, and then and this is the uh, image before uh, the, the lift treatment. We just want to use a simulation to make sure uh, this is basically uh, like electric field strength can be much, much stronger and then can reach the, the threshold of the uh, of the, the strands that can cause microbial activation. And then this is the image showing that after this uh, loading of the microorganisms. And I'll show you a very short video and showing basically how this process happening. Basically, the red dots here indicates the microorganisms has been inactivated. So they are they are dead cells. So basically, at the beginning, there are already some dead cells, right? So it's basically some, uh, but most the majority of the cells are still alive. And then you can pay attention to these basically the, near the these lines indicating where the, uh, the, the the tip structures are. So please pay attention to these uh, the the, tip, the tips of these nano structures. And then you will see uh, when the time starts from zero, these places will get light up, right? So oh, and also only this process get light up. Basically, these areas are the lo are the locations we have the strong electric field, and other places actually uh, the cells were still maintained alive. So this is the, the results after a little bit of the processing of the, of the image. So basically we are, we are indicating the locations where the lift uh, process really happening. So uh, we noticed that this is a really uh, very fast process in the previous, previous video. And then uh, there's a couple of seconds really limited by the, the time, the, the, the speed we can use a camera to catch the, the uh, image. Um, but we, we, we try to, we, which we notice that it's a very fast process, but we want to figure out how fast this process can be. So we keep pushing the, the electric field passes, basically that's the duration of the, uh, of the electric field, uh, you know, down to a very, very short period to see what's the limit there. Eventually we figure out that even with a single pass of 20 nanoseconds, okay, with a certain electric field strength, uh, the 20 nanoseconds is already really, really fast, right? So one nanosecond is 10 to the minus nine of a second. So you create, and then this is this 20 nanoseconds is really limited by the instrument we have. Basically, the, you, you apply the pass, the, it, it takes some time for the voltage to, to, to increase, and then it takes also some time for, for the voltage to decline. So really 20 nanoseconds is pretty much the, the, the shortest speed, uh, electric pulses we can apply using the equipment. And then we notice that even this one single pass treatment, and then uh, the, the line here indicates the fluorescence uh, uh, intensity, basically indicating how, how much this kind of uh, dye has been diffused into the cell, indicating the, the, the cell membrane damage. So as you can see here, uh, you know, the, the, there will be some variations of different cells. Each individual line indicating one single cell. Uh, the, uh, we monitor the individual cells. 
But basically, the idea is that uh, for one typical sample, right? So basically, at the beginning, there's no any diffusion of the dye into the cells. But as the time goes on, and then uh, you know, eventually, the cell will be com completely uh, pretty much red. Um, and then keep in mind that this diffusion actually, the, you know, the time here is actually limited by the diffusion rate of the dye rather than the treatment speed. So the treatment really happens at the very early beginning, just 20 nanoseconds. Okay, so but it takes some time and then uh, for the dye to diffuse into the cell. And then the sun of the damage will probably be, more, be you know, more severe and then it takes much shorter time for the dye to diffuse. Right. Basically, the general idea is that the treatment can be extremely fast uh, because this, as I mentioned, this is the actual physical process relies on the movement of the ions rather than electrochemical chemical reactions, usually which will take some time for the electrochemical chemical oxidation or reduction to happen. Um, so just a comparison with the, uh, the, this kind of conventional electric field treatment without the nanostructures. Uh, and then also the, uh, the other is the lift with the nano enhancement. You can see that for the conventional electric field treatment, we, we, there's no any further enhancement, just a flat electrode without the nano wire structures. And then even though, you know, we, 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 we keep the uh, pause width of the 20 nanosecond, but basically this uh, total effect, effective treatment time means that you have a, applied multiple of these pauses, right? So even uh, for one, uh, over 1 million or 10 million of these nanosecond pauses to the total treatment time of 20 milliseconds, which is still pretty fast compared to other process, but still you don't see a very significant enhancement, uh, enhanced uh, inactivation. But for the lift process, you can see uh, if you compare the, the 20 nano, uh, 200 microsecond treatment, basically we can achieve the, the voltage being reduced, uh, the electric field strength can be reduced by eight times. And also if you compare the single tr pulse treatment, like right, 20 nanosecond with the 200 millisecond treatment uh, with the with the similar voltage, uh, similar electric field strength, 55 kilovolt per centimeter, you can see basically the time scale has been reduced by 10 to the six times. So basically that means that we can either reduce the voltage significantly by eight times, which is actually already a, a significant reduce, or we can significantly enhance, uh, you know, increase the, the treatment speed all the way from uh, the 200 nan milliseconds to only just 20 nanoseconds, one pass, that's good enough to kill the microorganisms in most cases. Um, so based on this platform, we also uh, we, we also have done some basic mechanism study. We're trying to make sure we want to demonstrate that this, this fast, ultra fast uh, microbial activation is really due to the electrical operation other than other mechanisms. So I'll just show you some uh, experiments quickly to demonstrate that. So first one is that uh, one of the unique property of the electroporation process is that before a very strong uh, uh, ir irreversible electroporation, there will be a reversible one. Uh, basically, you, the, the pores will be able to, to seal or recover after this treatment. So we demonstrate that by, by, by doing you know, uh, uh, the, the, the lift process with a much lower voltage, like much lower uh, electric field strength. So in this case, it's still 20 nanosecond pauses, but the, the electric field strength is 12 kilovolt per centimeter. As you can see here, basically, we, uh, this is a time, and then we also monitor the, the for instance, uh, intensity. As you can see, basically, the pink, pink area, we turn on the electric field pauses. And then you can see the for instance increase. But once we turn off the electric field treatment, the the basically will the 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 uh, increase of the for instance intensity will immediately stop. And then because the, the which really indicates the recovery of these pores, it's also happening in a very very fast uh, time in, in a time phase. So basically, after that, you will become flat, and then once you turn it on, you will increase, and then you become flat again when it's turning off. So it takes really a couple of times on and off, and then to accumulate enough you know electric field treatment to eventually fully get inactivated, then you will see a, a, a significant increase after that. We absolutely we, we can see this phenomenon on different you know, cells, or positive electrical, negative electrical, uh, really that indicates that the actual field, electrical operation is the, 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 the main mechanism induce uh, the microbial inactivation. Especially in this case, right, we have the similar phenomenon for both positive and also negative electrical which is usually not the, 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 the case for the electrochemical reactions. 
Uh, we also rule out the, uh, the the possibility of RLS generation in this system. So basically, I will just just quickly show you where we have demonstrated that we have a, we have uh, applied a dye to indicate the uh, oxidative oxidative stress. So basically, under under the uh, the, the conditions, we already achieve uh, using the twenty nanosecond process, we already achieve more than ninety percent microbial inactivation, but we don't see any uh, no oxidative uh, stress build up in the system. Uh, which is a control sample is that if you use a two microsecond process, uh, it will be very obvious uh, oxidative stress. Uh, the last uh, basic experiments we've done is that we try to use these floating nano structures or nano wedges. We, uh, we also demonstrate that even these nano wedge materials, they are not directly connecting to the bulk electrode on the two sides. They also achieve pretty uh, 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 high performance in terms of microbial activation. This is also not possible for electrochemical reactions, which will really you the electrodes have to connect it to the to the bulk electrodes to the connect it to the circuit. Right. So this is also indication of this is the electric field treatment rather than electrochemical reactions or others. Um, okay. So to uh, summarize the today's presentation, I just want to show you this slide, which shows the. Uh, uh, basically, the, either the demonstrated or potential advantages of the lift technology. So we we really believe this can be a transformative uh, technology for the water disinfection se uh, sector, and then especially uh, this technology the, the is very high efficiency. You have demonstrated that uh, it theoretically has a very broad spectrum to, uh, and very effective to all pathogens, and then all, we also demonstrate it's a very very fast process. So uh, one of the intrinsic uh, advantage of this technology compared to other existing, you know, some, especially the chemical-based technology, that theoretically this is the actual physical process. Theoretically, this process should not generate any disinfection byproducts, even though we, in some cases will it will probably still some current consumption, still some disinfection byproduct generated, but it theoretically can be really, really small and very, very, very pretty much negligible. Um, some of the other technology were still on the way trying to you know, push, push it forward, but theoretically or potentially, these are the really advantages we can have uh, for the lift in the future. With that, uh, I would like to thank all my students, uh, especially uh, my current postdoc in one and then a, a, a PhD student, Jonathan Joe, graduated uh, three years ago, who really contributed most of the uh, work I presented today. I also want to thank all my funding agencies for this work. Thank you very much. I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you may have later. Uh, thank you, Professor Sia, for the wonderful talk of lead technology for water disinfection. And now let's welcome uh, the third speaker, Dr. Ria Verbecki. She will be talking about the Open Membrane Database, an open access user sourced library of water purification and desalination membranes. Uh, Ria, you can start now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yuan. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. Hello, everyone. It's a real ple pleasure for me to be here to showcase the OMD, OMD to you. So, what is the OMD? It's actually an archive of uh, membrane performance data. So what do we do? We input uh, data from uh, peer-reviewed articles, commercial data sheets, and patterns. And then the output of the database is selectivity permeability plots, and also some other information on how the membranes were made. And right now, uh, we have over 1,000 reverse osmosis data points. We launched it in uh, August 2021, and if you want, you can have a look online. Uh, this is the URL of the database, but I would really much appreciate if you could first follow my talk and then afterwards uh, go and look at it. But apparently, we have uh, quite some visitors. I looked it up just recently, and we have about 500 unique visitors per month, so it's uh, quite well visited. And we also um, wrote an article about it in the Journal of Membrane Science, of which you can find the details here. Um, the topics of my talk today are the following. So first, I want to start uh, on a high level. So the water um, water uh, crisis we are in right now and how membrane desalination can help to tackle this crisis. Then I want to uh, ask a question like why would a database actually be useful? Would it be useful? And I hope I can convince you after my talk today that it could be useful. And then uh, I want to dive in a bit deeper into the founding principles of the OMD and then how we collected the data, what the constraints on the data are. Um, and then I would also like to share with you the online tools that we installed on the website. So these are the uh, membrane submission forms and also the calculators. And then lastly, I would like to conclude with where we are right now and where we would like to go. 
So first of all, the global water crisis, um, just on a very general level, it occurs when the demand exceeds the availability of water. So what are the factors that are that are increasing the demand? This is the growing world population, uh, the increasing living standard, and also the change in consumption patterns, patterns, for example, towards more meat, which is a very water uh, intensive product. Then on the other hand, the availability also goes down because of uh, climate change, because of the changes in our hydrological cycle, and also the uh, quality of the water goes down because of increased pollution. Um, so what can we do to fight uh, water scarcity? Uh, well, I think we need combined solutions so we can change our own human behavior, what we do, what we buy, what we eat. Uh, we can also um, enforce policies to take place. So, for example, restore and protect uh, our water reservoirs. And then thirdly, there is also technology which can play a role. And while I will focus on technology uh, through the OMD, I think it's important that we don't forget the global picture. Uh, so with respect to technology, um, I want to focus on desalination, on desalination membranes and how they can help tackle the global water crisis. So how do how could these desalination membranes do that? Well, actually, the overall picture is very easy. So I'm showing you a membrane here. We force seawater over it. We pressurize it. The salt, the green balls here are being rejected. The water passes through the membrane. And so at the end, we have two output streams, a highly concentrated salt solution and a fresh water solution, which can then be used for human consumption or for other applications. Um, when we look at membrane research, on specifically on desalination, so on reverse osmosis membranes, then we actually see that these membranes didn't improve that much over the last 30 years. So I'm showing this uh, in, in a plot. So on the y-axis, we have water salt selectivity, and on the x-axis, we have water permeability. And so actually, the, the best membrane ever would be the one in the upper right corner, uh, right at the top there. And so these all these data points were gathered from the OMD, um, and you can see two curves, which we call upper bound curves. And the, the, the more up the curve goes to the right uh, top corner, uh, the better the membrane is. And you actually see that between uh, 1990 and 2021, when we launched the database, very little improvement was made, which to me is really striking because so many researchers are working on this. A lot of research resources are going in it a lot of time. But apparently it doesn't seem to work that well to increase, um, to drastically increase the membrane performance. Why is that? Well, I think uh, again, here we have a black box topic. It's because we don't really understand which factors are governing a membrane transport and how we can maximize them. So in our field, we call these the synthesis structure performance relationships, and these are all intertwined. So how the synthesis parameters of a membrane influence the structure of the membrane, and then how this structure is influencing the performance. And right now we don't know. So what do we do? We just um, have a trial and error approach. We try stuff in the lab. We try to do it as best as we can, but apparently it's not working so well. So my argument is how can we solve this? Well, we need data. We need a database. So this is one argument of why I thought in 2020 why we needed a database, but there's actually also a second one and that is to increase resource and time efficiency. And so I'm showing you a picture here. You can imagine this was me during my PhD. I developed a new type of membrane and I wanted to benchmark it with the state of the art. And then it was so frustrating because the data of the membranes are scattered in different journals. Uh, it's just all over the place. Then you don't really know if you can use it. Uh, you don't really know how they were collected, etc. So it's just very time consuming to find the data that you want to compare your membranes with. And then secondly, very often the data is not readable. So you're looking at your screen, you're zooming in, uh, the resolution is not that good, but the raw data is never shared. So what is then actually the real data point that you need? Very often it was not readable. And then thirdly, the data is not standardized. So very often uh, the data that other researchers publish, the other researchers publish, is not collected in the same way as I did it. And we know that the operational conditions play a very big role in how the membrane performs. And so it's actually not uh, completely correct to compare these data points. And then I was thinking, hmm, if I'm having all these frustrations, probably many other PhD students and other researchers also have these frustrations. So why they not try to come up with another idea to make our field more resource and time efficient. And again, with in, in mind to help um, tackle the global water crisis by optimizing membrane performance. 
So then why would the database improve the field? Well, first of all, to better understand, as I made the point earlier, to better understand the synthesis structure performance relationship. Secondly, to standardize membrane data so that we are actually able to compare them in a correct scientific way. And thirdly, to share the knowledge that we have and to share our data. And then um, we started looking into databases that were already in place and that could serve as inspiration. And then we found these two, so the Cambridge Structural Database, which is in the field of metal organic frameworks, and the Protein Data Bank. And this, when you look at when they were founded, 1960s, 1970s, I thought, oof, we're really far behind. We really need to step up our game. And because the database wasn't there, we thought, OK, let's create one. And then this is how the OMD came into play. I uh, um, co-founded the OMD with, in total, uh, 12 people from four different universities. And these, uh, the foundational principles of the OMD, I will show you here. So first of all, it was really important. It's completely free and open access. I'm a strong advocate for open science and open data. So this were, was really like crucial for us that it would be completely free and that you don't need to uh, register at all. So you can just go to the URL and all the data will be there. Secondly, uh, we wanted it to be crowdsourced so that it would be a community effort to get all the data in there and that it would be sustained over time by the whole community. Then thirdly, um, to have a high quality of data, we decided to only incorporate peer-reviewed uh, data from peer-reviewed journals, from commercial data sheets and from patents. And then fourthly, we wanted to unify the membrane reporting to really show how all the data were collect, uh, collected and under which conditions. And then fourthly, I think it's really important that we look at the problems we are having on a global scale. And so I wanted this uh, to be an international collaboration, which in the end worked out quite well because we had uh, Yale University on the team, KU Leuven, and my home university in Belgium, at the University of Technion in Israel, and then also Hong Kong University. So what are then the advantages of the OMD over the status quo? I will share with you a table here. So what do I mean with the status quo? It's quite simple. I just mean uh, review articles, which let's say are published every um, one to two years. So then all the data is present in the review articles, but you only have it every two years when someone decides to write it, right? Well, for the OMD, the data would be updated in real time. Every time an article would be published, it would directly be imported into the OMD. Then regarding the sources of the data, often reviews are uh, written with a specific scope in mind. So you will only find the data that is related to that specific scope. Well, for the OMD, we want to cover the whole field of membrane desalination. Uh, thirdly, the processing of the data, as I mentioned before, in articles, it's quite variable. It really depends on the research groups and yeah, just the, the history of that research group, how they did it over time. Uh, while for the OMD, it's very uniform and transparent. You can, you can have a look at the OMD, how we did it. Also in the article, it's uh, really well written. Um, data exploration, well, in the status quo, in review articles, it's just not possible. You just have a 2D graph. Uh, you cannot do anything with it. Well, for the OMD, it's super interactive. I will show this to you a bit later. You can hover over the points. You can um, um, select different points, uh, but I will come back to this later. So it's really super interactive um, with a very nice user interface. And then a very important other point is accessibility. So when you want to compare your own research with uh, research, uh, for example, in review articles, and you want the data points, you need to contact the, the authors themselves and very often this is with low success rates uh, just because the data has not yet been shared. Uh, well, for the OMD, the, you have just complete open access to all the raw data points. So how can then uh, the OMD help advance membrane technology? So first of all, it would help us to benchmark novel reverse osmosis membranes. So for example, those made with uh, different chemistries or which were modified. Uh, with respect to the state of the art. And then very important, it would allow us to conduct meta-analysis to, amongst others, better understand these membrane synthesis structure performance relationships, which I think are really primordial for optimizing uh, in a significant way uh, desalination membranes. And then 4D, we also wanted it to be a tool that the, that the field could use. So we incorporated membrane calculators 
uh, or calculators just for membrane performance, uh, concentration polarization, and osmotic pressure, because we found out that actually these, uh, let's say, routine calculations are not so easy for people who are not uh, so familiar with the field. And actually, this is, uh, let's say, relatively often because membrane technology is really at the um, how to say at the crossroads of many different uh, disciplines, many fields of science. And so we thought it would be nice if we could really make this um, a high interdisciplinary research field with information available to everyone. So then uh, I would like to uh, dive a bit deeper into the data itself. So the origins and the constraints that we had to put on the data. Um, yeah, just as yeah, what we decided to do to the data, so you're all aware of this. Um, as I mentioned before, this is coming from peer-reviewed literature, commercial data sheets and patents. And as of now, I just did the calculations last week. With all the data that is out there, 77% is coming from peer-reviewed scientific reports, 4% from commercial data sheets, and then 90% from patents. But this will, of course, vary over time, depending on uh, what the input uh, fields are. And then um, we decided to define a reverse osmosis membrane as a membrane which has an intrinsic rejection for sodium chloride of 80%. So this is the limit that we put, just a constraint that we had to put in order to um, select which um, articles we would be we would um, uh, upload to the OMD. But this is, I want to stress, this is not a general definition or anything. This is just what we decided to do. However, what is really important is that we are not interested in only the best performing membrane. We want to understand the general principles that are governing uh, or that maximize membrane performance. So if you, for example, have membranes um, that, go, that range from 60% to all the way up to 99% sodium chloride rejection, then it's really important to upload all the different data points because it's actually in the series that there is a lot of information present on what is really uh, crucial to obtain a good membrane. Uh, the input collected by the OMD. So first of all, uh, we want to know which type of membrane it is. So asymmetric, TFC, TFN, inorganic. Uh, this is just very general. But then we also need some more detailed information on how the membranes were tested. So the solution chemistry, um, um, the concentration polarization modulus. And then also we would want to know some physical characteristics, uh, whether they were post-treated, which uh, chemicals were used to make the membranes, and whether they were modified or not. And then thirdly, of course, very important, the performance characteristics. So it's important to know the A and B parameters of the membrane, as well as um, observed rejection and real rejection. The functionality of the OMD. So this is uh, what I stressed already in the table that I showed you before. Um, so when you go to the OMD website, it would look a bit like this. So you have uh, many different filters that you can apply on the data. The chart is super interactive, so when you hover over the data points, you will see data callouts popping up. Uh, so you can see the actual uh, data, so the A and B parameters here, for example. Uh, then you can also select data points on the graph, and then automatically a table will appear, appear on the bottom, which will have all the information in tabulated form uh, on how the membrane was made, the article of which it's coming from, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can also export this table um, as a CSV file, so you can just do whatever you want with it on your own computer. And also the um, uh, image, so the graph itself, it can be exported as a PNG file. Then it's important to know that the submissions are open to everyone. If these, um, if they are, uh, excuse me, <laughs> this is submissions are open to everyone if they are eligible according to the criteria I showed you before. So you need to enter the report data then you need to provide some contact information of yourself. And then uh, thirdly, you need to, of course, submit the membrane data. And when you have done that, then um, the data will be reviewed by someone from the OMD team. And if uh, it is accepted, then it will be directly uh, uploaded online and then your data will be there. Um, as I mentioned before, the calculators are really important um, to help the users. And um, so we decided to incorporate four calculators. So the membrane performance, the concentration polarization, and the osmotic pressure calculators, and then also a common uh, unit converter. So to go from the US system to the metric system. Um, and this we did yeah, to just facilitate the termination of membrane performance and all the other uh, parameters that I mentioned here to avoid errors, because uh, for some people, um, 
the formulas that are being used are not so common and so we just wanted to facilitate the whole process and also here this is a step-by-step -step process so i'm showing you here a little picture of how it looks like so you just input the water flux you input the applied pressure and then the calculator will give you the output as the a parameter so where do we stand now we actually received a lot of positive feedback uh, many people are visiting the OMD, also the paper is being highly cited, so we're really happy with that. However, I want to stress that um, we have only one external submission since August 2021, uh, which is kind of alarming, um, also disappointing and shocking, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, yeah, so the field is not really engaging, is not yet uploading their own data, uh, even though they are really using the database a lot. So we really need to involve the field in this uh, because data is only relevant if it's a lot of data. Um, otherwise, the conclusions that you draw might not be correct. So how um, can we do this to involve the field? Well, all of you, you and your colleagues, please upload your data and talk about it. I think it's really important that people are aware of the OMD. Um, also, secondly, we're uh, talking with journals uh, who would mandate the um, uh, researchers to upload their data on an open repository, and then the OMD can be populated directly from this open repository to increase the sustainability of the database. But if you have any other ideas, if you think of something, then please let me know. I would be very happy to get your feedback on this. And then also a little outlook um, of the OMD for reverse osmosis. So what do we want to do? We want to revisit uh, some of the assumptions we made for concentration polarization so that people, um, yeah, so that this is, now we are assuming, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but uh, now we are assuming a thousand, a hundred LMH for the uh, mass transfer coefficients. And we want to, um, yeah, facilitate this, this assumption through uh, opening uh, the, um the discussion with the field actually on this because this is really not uniform uh, for desalination membranes um then we also want to highlight the membranes that were tested under standard conditions so that those would become a gold standard and this is then to um to uh, ignite the field to really use the same conditions so that it would facilitate comparison between different membranes we also want to incorporate trace organic contaminants so move away from sodium chloride and incorporate, uh, yeah, let's say pesticides and uh, pharmaceuticals, etc., to see if we could also establish these uh, synthesis structure performance relationships for these contaminants specifically. And we also would like to include a dynamic upper bound, so depending on the filters that you apply, that you can see the line changing. Um, and then, lastly, as I as I already mentioned, I think it's really important um, to um, tie the journals to the OMD so that it would facilitate the automatic data transfer so that we have uh, so that we can actually ensure the, the sustainability of the database and have um, yeah can draw really strong conclusions of uh, the data that are there. However, I also want to share with you my long term vision for the OMD. We actually would like to see it as a real database hub. So not only for reverse osmosis membranes, but also for all the other uh, membrane technologies that are out there. So nanofiltration, ion exchange membranes, even for batteries and for gas separation, for solvent separations, et cetera. So every field would have their own database and the hub would be the OMD as such. And so right now we are also working on the development of uh, the solvent resistant nanofiltration and organic solvent nanofiltration database. Um, so yeah, to summarize, so this is uh, the idea is that to make the OMD a very collaborative project to really advance our field. So once again, I would like to ask you to submit your membrane data, um, talk about this with the people around you, because really the more data we have, the more knowledge we have, and the higher chance that we have to reach a scientific breakthrough, which is, I think, uh, really worth it, uh, especially provided the uh, very scary water crisis we are in right now. Uh, so thank you all to all the involved parties. You can see that many people were involved. It's uh, It's been really my pleasure to lead this project um, and I hope it will be uh, sustained by all of you. So please um, spread the word and get involved. And thanks again to everyone who was already involved and thanks to all of you for listening. Thank you, Ria, for introducing us to a very useful OMD database. Uh, so everyone who's uh, working on RO membrane, you can share your data and upload your data on the OMD database.
Um, so um, that is all for today's uh, presentations. And uh, now let's us uh, and now let's move on to the Q and A session. So we've collected some questions for uh, from the Q and A box. And uh, the first question is for Professor Ersman Gwintun. Um, so the question is, since water can contain various microplutins, has there been development of any special index which considers those current microplutin of concern in the drinking water and allows generation of pollution index for the water? Similarly, is there any index for toxicity level? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for this question. So the uh, drinking water regulations are, of course, a thing that are quite national or, you know, for uh, countries like in the EU, they have a common drinking water regulation and they're based on uh, standards, drinking water standards for individual compounds or for some parameters. But toxicity parameters are not included yet in, in these uh, in, in the drinking water regulations. Also, typically, you need to pre-concentrate the drinking water quite dramatically to find toxicity caused by micropollutants. So this is sometimes done to assess the toxicity, for example, by the mutagenicity, by uh, AIMS test or uh, the estrogenicity of the drinking water. But then you need to pre-concentrate it very significantly. And uh, this is not something that is uh, uh, required by the regulations, drinking water regulators. Uh, thank you, Professor Van Gunten, for the detailed answer. And now uh, we also have two questions for Professor Asie. So the first question is, if I understand the leaf technology cannot replace primary disinfectants such as chlorine, UV, and ozone, uh, it can also be used for stability in the distribution system? Uh, you mentioned, I think that the both questions are kind of similar. I thought about the, the scale. Maybe you can also read out the second question so I can answer them together. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, um, can electric field be also scaled up and utilized for disinfection of treated water from small municipal uh, wastewater treatment plants, such as decentralized unit with capacity below 50 uh, uh, cubic meters per day or about two cubic meters per hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for both questions. Uh, I think it both about the uh, scaling up of the process. So uh, I think this, this technology is really still in a very, very early stage. Uh, we are kind of very, very careful or cautious in terms of, you know, declining whether this technology can be used for how big the scale it is. But theoretically, or, or if you just look at the mechanism, fundamental mechanism, there's no any limit of this technology it cannot be used for a much larger scale, even in the primary treatment. So we start with the very small scale demonstration like in our benchtop devices. And also the flow rate currently is pretty small, uh, like it's only a few milliliter per minute, something like that. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge at this point is that the uh, electrical development, uh, especially when we want to combine the uh, the, the macro scale and micro scale enhancement, especially when we want, when we need to use nano wire structures on the electrode. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, even the best electrode materials we have with the nano wires, you can only last for a couple hours uh, with the you know the synthetic water we prepare in the lab. Um, and then it's probably good for some point of use devices for or emergency, emergency applications at this point, right? So for these cases, you, you, you probably just use one time or, you know, you, you only need to last for a few minutes on and off. But at least for this kind of design for large scale application, it's definitely, it's definitely not ready yet, right? even, even for pipeline applications. Um, but, but if we only use the, uh, the macro scale uh, enhancement without the nanowires, just basically designing bulk electrodes or designing assistance by you know uh, different configuration of the electrodes, we will be able to already enhance the electric field strength at certain locations by at least 20, 30 uh, times. So in this, with, with that direction, actually, it's it's already getting much closer to scaling up. Uh, but to be honest, in that case, the electric field strength will not be 
pretty in most cases will still not be strong enough to kill microorganisms just by the by the electric field treatment itself. So in that case, most likely it still need to be combined with either ozonation or copper or other disinfection process. But that should be able to significantly reduce the, 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 the doses of the, the conventional um, disinfectants. So yeah, so basically we're also considering all these whether you know which you know uh, whether the technology can be scaling up or not, or which which part. But definitely this is something we want to we want to you know push forward in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Xie. And uh, we also have a question from Urs Teria. Uh, so how do you guarantee a long-term operation or organization of OMD? Is there some long-term funding for this? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question that I often uh, receive. So yeah, right now we don't have any long-term funding. We're trying to get funding for it, but it's not so easy because it falls into different categories and yeah, there's not really a specific funding for this type of infrastructure yet in Europe, at least in the US, they do have it, but at Europe, it's uh, more difficult. Um, so right now I'm doing this as part of my postdoc uh, and we are trying to, um, yeah, get it funded just from other projects that we have funding from. Uh, but the idea is to, in the future, through funding that hopefully we would uh, get, is to have one person uh, um, uh, dedicated to it half a day a week to revise the membrane data to upload it um and to yeah to make it sustainable but in the end the like the real vision the idealistic vision would be that it would sustain that it would be sustained by the community itself so not that the omd team would be uploading the data so may i quickly react to this or sure. Uh, you know, we had uh, we are kind of developing this platform for pathway prediction in oxidation processes, and we actually had the problem of the long-term funding because it doesn't count as a like research project. So the National Science Foundation will not fund this, mm. and also the our institution does not fund it. So it's very difficult to uh, kind of have such uh, databases in long term. There is a database from NIST in the US uh, for oxidation kinetics. And this was financed until maybe the 1990s. And since then, there's no new data in there. And uh, I mean, it's still very useful, but uh, it's a pity then it's, it was discontinued with the retirement of the people who are in charge of it. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's really important to think mm -hmm. about the long term funding of such a platform to guarantee that it will also be active in 10 years from now. Yes, it's a, it's a very valid point. Yes. Uh, however, hopefully we would be able because now I'm uh, negotiating with different journals to make it uh, more automatic so that we are not depending on individual researchers. But this is just part of it. Of course, the database should still yeah be there also in 10 years. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the comment. It's an important one. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we have another question for Ria. Uh, sometimes the journals are not interested on in publishing regular performance papers for memories, as there may not be an innovative component in the information presented. How the OMD would tackle this situation? Also, would the OMD cover ultrafiltration membranes in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so we would like, so let me first answer the second question. So we would like to extend it to ultrafiltration membranes. So if you have uh, interest in, in collaborating, we're more than welcome to um, to open the OMD to other universities and other researchers. And uh, regarding the first question, so the idea is that uh, journals would mandate researchers to upload their raw data into an open repository, and that via uh, data screening tools, the OMD would be automatically fed from this open repository. Um, so then the journal uh, is actually kind of the intermediary between the researcher and the OMD, and this would make it uh, completely self-sustainable. Okay, thank you, Ria, for the answer. So I think it, well, it is a very meaningful uh, thing to work on, but it might be very difficult to keep working on it, right? Yes. Uh, so we also have a question for Professor Xie. So what is the cost estimation of the lead for treatment? Yeah, so uh, that's also a very good question. We always ask ourselves. Um, so, but the answer, short answer is that still too early to estimate the cost at this stage. 
uh, especially it depends on the scale, right? And then, uh, I, but I can tell you that the, the main cost will really be the capital cost of the device, right? So uh, rather than comparing to other you know, chemical uh, disinfectants, you know, as consume a lot of chemicals, but in this case, the energy consumption is really, really low, much lower than conventional electric field treatment, which may be at least two or three orders or the order magnitude lower, but also even lower than uh, UV or ozonation, at least one order of magnitude lower. Because we only generate pulses, which are not supposed to be very, very small current. So the the, the, the energy consumption, the electricity consumption directly converted to a cost is extremely low, almost negligible. But really, the main cost is the is the capital cost of the system to generate the, the electric pulses we need, and also the stability of the electro. If they can be really, really stable, the, the overall cost can be much lower. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xie. And uh, also, we have another uh, question for Professor uh, Van Quinten. Uh, wish to know Professor's observations on application of ferret for treatment of recalcitrant pollutants. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, I mean, there has been quite a lot of research on ferret uh, to oxidize uh, micropollutants, and uh, ferret is a quite a powerful oxidant but it's also quite selective so you don't have this broadband oxidation capacity as for example ozone where you have direct ozone reactions but also OH radical reactions and then the other thing is that uh, so far there's no commercial production of ferrate so it's still a uh, quite unclear whether ferrate could uh, actually be applied in larger scale treatment. So I think they're still missing and, uh, you know, the ferrate uh, synthesis is not so easy and is relatively expensive. So I think uh, it's at the moment, moment, it's not competitive to other oxidative treatment. Uh, thank you, Ars. And uh, we also have two questions for you. The first one is, when biodegrades organic matter, how an after filtration system will it still be antimicrobial as per the graphs in normal cases? Uh, I didn't understand the, um, the beginning of um, the I will, question. Uh, yeah, I can type the question in the chat box for you. So the biodegradable organic matter, typically the, you know, biodegradable organic matter doesn't have antimicrobial activity so typically this uh, degradation of the biodegradable organic matter leads to a better stability of the water so then for the distribution system you don't need uh, such high uh, residual disinfectants and this leads to a much better quality so uh, in many countries in Europe, such as uh, Switzerland, Germany, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Austria, there is only very little use of uh, disinfectant residual in distribution systems because uh, there is usually a biofiltration to get rid of the biodegradable organic matter. So the microbial regrowth in the distribution system can be limited. And uh, this is the main reason why we do a uh, biological filtration to get rid of these compounds. Hello, I think that we lost Professor Yu Meng. So in terms of the questions, we do have, we have received some more, but I think that considering of the time, I would recommend that we follow up on the conclusion of this. Um, I would like to conclude this webinar on behalf of IWA and the SGs. And before concluding, I would like to invite all of you to attend our following webinar on sunny action, understanding urban sanitation regulation challenges. It's in partnership with Waterlinks, and it's going to be next week on 8th of February. And I also want to invite all of you to join our networks of water professional. You can use this exclusive um, discount that we have for a 20% discount off for a new membership. And on behalf of IWA and the SG, I would like to thank for all the speakers for attending today and also the participants for making all the questions and uh, coming to our webinar. 
Thank you, everyone.